right. Hello. Welcome to Ryan Research. I'm Peter Ryan. I am joined today by Christoph. He is a very good writer, uh, proficient in the history of economics, uh, developmental economics, and uh, his own native Poland. Uh, very curious to talk more about all manner of subjects touching on all those things. Uh, but before we do, can you please introduce yourself? Um, yeah, I um, studied uh, international, re international re relations and uh, sociology in Poland. Um, I went to work in one of uh, governmental agencies that oversee uh, the industrial policy in my country. Yeah, I spent the, spend there uh, some time and, you know, after a while, I, um, you know, I think I think that I, that I reached you know some limit and exhausted all the you know all the possibilities to to learn. So um, and yeah, while being there, I discovered you know all this uh, literature on um, uh, East Asian developmentalism. So I uh, you know that that um, uh, that prompted me to leave the agency and uh, concentrate more on you know reading and writing and you know um, i i have you know the comfort to to do so so i you know devoted myself to it and i'm going you know to uh, do it for a while <laughs> i think all right yeah and i think um we first kind of came into contact over our shared interest in eric highliner's recent work uh, <clears throat> the Neo Mercantilist. I also had uh, Eric Highliner on to talk about his book in a previous podcast for anyone that wants to go check that out. Uh, and you wrote a fantastic essay uh, for American Affairs where you explored his book, kind of expanded on the ideas, brought some other thinkers in. So I'd love to for you to give your summary of what you think of that book. Um, yeah, I think that it's, um, you know, very important book, uh, essential book to really um, understand what's happening uh, right now. And um, because I think that um, we are in the process of moving to a system where um, large part of the allocation of resources is not left to markets anymore. And um, we really don't know how it works, right? Because most of our economists are trained in, in uh, free market economics, in free markets and not in history. And uh, we, you know, we tend to, we fail to grasp that, you know, as Schumpeter said, mm -hmm. capitalism is a uh, evolutionary process, right? So I think that uh, we need to get familiar with the concepts of neo-mercantilism and political economy. And this, uh, this book, The Neo-Mercantilist, it, you know, it help, helps us to do exactly, exactly that. So uh, what's, what's interesting is that you, know, uh, you read this book and you can, um, you can get this... Um, you realize that um, the you know neoclassical economists and uh, liberals they um, they tend to um, they tend to aim towards you know global welfare while while you know neo mercantilists they uh, understand their their goal as uh, the you know uh, national welfare and they see um, they see um, they see economics uh, as a as a part of as a branch of geopolitics. You know, so uh, I think that uh, by outlining all those uh, diverse uh, strands strains of of uh, neo mercantilist thought, Helliner is is really you know uh, helpful to uh, is is really um, indispensable it's indispensable for us to to grasp what's what's happening around us right yeah yeah and um 
you know, I, I think I became intrigued by it the same reasons that you did, um, you know, uh, coming from sort of an economics background, uh, you know, just made that there's sort of a lack of history. Uh, I had to kind of supplement that as I went. And, uh, you know, outside of just the numbers and the charts, you start to realize there's there's much more of a sort of humanities um, requirement for really understanding how economies work and, and how things function, uh, knowing how to create the right structures of, you know, is it global welfare, like you said, or is it the nation? Is it the individual? And uh, these are all things that different thinkers that Heliner brings up uh, kind of get to. They talk about, well, who's benefiting? And and uh, a possible criticism of this sort of perspective is that, you know, could it be two zero some game, some degree of like if someone's winning, someone's losing. But uh, I think it's the more authentic way to look at it. It's more of a realist approach to, you know, understanding that the economy, uh, the global economy is, is a matter of international relations of, uh, you know, naturally competitive groups. And um, if you do not take the right policy stance in terms of, uh, you know, uh, again, what probably more familiar term for people is protectionism, of uh, setting up tariffs and, and things that are, are similar in that vein, uh, you're going to be wrecked as an economy, you're going to be sort of backwards. Um, so, so where do you think that kind of falls in, in trying to understand the economy as something that needs this active protectionism versus, um, you know, hey, is, is it, isn't the long sort of modern industrial era all about how we liberalize more and more and more? Like, how do we, like, why do we think that this hidden history of neo-mercantilism is important? Um, yeah, uh, it's important because, you know, it um, shows us that we were living in, you know, in the world of um, uh, false assumptions and that led us to false, uh, false certitudes and, you know, and that uh, those assumptions were maybe, you know, uh, somewhat noble, right? But in the end, you know, every self-delusion, even if it's noble, you know, leaves a leaves a debt to pay. And if we don't want to pay this this debt, right, we had to, you know, um, grasp that uh, contrary to the liberal beliefs, growth is not automatic. It's a deliberate effort, right? Because the liberals. Um, the you know Anglo-American uh, from the Anglo-American tradition, they believe that you know the economy is so fluid, it's so unpredictable that every effort, every form of um, intervention is doomed to fail, right? And for uh, Friedrich List and Alexander Hamilton, right, uh, industrial development entails uh, some sort of market failure, right? Because you know, it uh, it's not like um, you have this move from uh, agriculture to small crafts and then to major industries just because uh, you know just because of the individual individual decisions of all those merchants, right? It's not happening happening uh, like that. So you have to have this um, you know this drive from the state to push push this industrial economy and all this progress into existence. So that's the you know, first thing. Uh, the other thing would be that, you know, the liberals, uh, you know, liberal free traders, they, um, they consider, um, they consider cons consumption as being the most important measure, right, of, uh, of economy. So, um, and least says that, you know, um, it's not the wealth, you know, that is important, but the forces, the productive forces that help you to create this wealth. So, you know, uh, it's not important what the society can buy, it can buy, but what it can make, what it can produce, right? Mm, then you have this, um, then you have this belief 
or in my, in, to put it another way, the liberals, they are concerned about how individuals fare as consumers and how uh, the world fare as a you know, global trade system, while uh, nationalists or protectionists protectionists they um, they're concerned more with all those intermediate levels right that are between the individual and uh, and the world and by that i mean communities and uh, and nations right um yeah so i think that's the main you know outline of of those differences and maybe not differences, but realities that were obscured by liberal ideology. Yeah, and do you think that um, liberal ideology, um, which, you know, we're, we're pretty satisfied with saying that it was created in England and uh, fostered and propagated by the English, uh, do you think the connection with um, their advanced start in the Industrial Revolution and then their global empire has a lot to do with the way in which liberalism um, articulates itself versus sort of people that were on the periphery of that, like Frederick List's Germany at the time, uh, where they're looking at, again, that more with um, uh, a realist lens and an understanding that, um, you know, this what this liberalism does in effect, rather than, you know, what like a David Ricardo was talking about with comparative advantage, in effect, liberalism actually keeps lesser developed nations um, in a subordinate position to the dominant player at that time, England. And it also behooves the dominant player who is the manufacturing superpower to have consumer markets vis-a-vis -vis their colonies or their you know, uh, quasi colonies uh, by keeping uh, other nations subdued so that they can have people buy their their goods. So how do you think England's specific role in history and then their global empire plays into the way we think about liberalism, how liberalism articulates itself and how the reactions to that form in neo-mercantilism? Um, yeah, you're right that um, basically uh, neo-mercantilism was born out of resistance to this uh, English system, right? Mm. Um, but um, it is, you know, it is significant, right? That um, that that Britain, that England was the pioneer of many of those activist policies, of many of those, you know, trade policies and um, subsidies and so on. That uh, and you know, it was this new form of activist policy that helped them reach the level that from which they could open up and you know um, and conquer the world right because they uh, reached a sufficient level of maturity and uh, i think the opposition to the system uh, arised in the united states right because you know and um, you know many liberal liberal theorists they they said that um, the U.S. is going to be you know uh, they use this they use this comparison like Poland that is you know an, a country that will forever be you know that will be deemed always to the agricultural sector right mm -hmm. and. Uh, but the you know the U.S. that wanted to you know um, uh, cease to be dependent on Britain, so and build up its own uh, in its own power and you know all those ideas from uh, all those protectionist neo mercantilist ideas have uh, their root in in the U.S. and it is there where it is in the U.S. where uh, where list you know converted uh, to those ideas when he when he learned about uh, protectionism and uh, it wasn't him that you know um, articulated the the logic of the infant uh, 
uh, industry protection argument, right? Uh, he he uh, because he, when he was in, in Europe, right, he was still uh, some kind of cosmopolitan, you know, vaguely, he was vaguely cosmopolitan, vaguely liberal. He was, you know, a little bit inspired by the French, some French thinkers. He tried to establish himself in France, but it was in the States that his vision, you know, crystallized and he became one of the links in this, you know, chain of American protectionist thought. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. 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 And so what do you think it was about sort of that American scene at the time where, um, you know, obviously you have the famous Hamilton that becomes an avatar of, of this school of economics. Uh, and then it gets carried on by a few different individuals. I like to focus on uh, uh, Matthew and Henry Carey, who um, uh, Highliner also goes into detail, especially Henry Carey. Um, and there's um, a number of other really good American protectionists in there. So what do you think it is about that American context that gives rise to near mercantilism that then Frederick Liss expands into Europe and uh, keeps spreading it? I think that certainly it was this, you know, uh, clear recognition that about the, you know, the uh, state of dependence mm -hmm. that was imposed uh, on the U.S., right? And maybe, you know, it, um, from that recognition emerged this, this, um, this feeling that they have to, you know, uh, break away from this uh, state and find their own way, right? And maybe on the continental side, this um, uh, this feeling, this recognition, wasn't as sharp as as in the as in the U.S. I think that maybe that was the the key factor here. Yeah, and so I guess more on the abstract level, like what is it about manufacturing and getting out of an agricultural state where that's your dominant activity in your economy? Why is manufacturing so important? Um, yeah, well, uh, you know, manufacturing is uh, is so important because it's uh, uh, it's an you could say that it's an engine that brings you uh, into modernity, right? Mm -hmm. And it's the most modern instrument instrument that you can use to safeguard your, you know, national interest and expand your economical reach, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that. Um, So you're, you're right that uh, Britain was, was the country that uh, ignited this opposition and, and um, you know, make uh, real, make, you know, given, gave this impulse to many thinkers in Europe and in, in States to, you know, uh, to, um, uh, grasp the situation of overdependence that was, you know, the um, that was un, uh, un that couldn't be sustained if they weren't to, you know, lose lose its, uh, you know, uh, um, range of maneuver, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, and so uh, I think. Uh... Eric Reinhardt is another good writer that talks about the history of this and really gets into describing why manufacturing is good. And, you know, he talks about how it's this, like you mentioned engine, but yeah, it's this kind of um, compounding activity where if, if you're manufacturing, you're thus like, uh, you're able to, of course, make refined goods, but you're making sort of productivity enhancements that increases your farming output at the same time. And so like by... And this has a lot to do with urbanization, density. And so by creating more urban areas, by creating density, by 
uh, stimulating innovation closer together, you increase productivity, you uh, increase your agricultural output, you allow population growth, and um, you keep yeah, basically it's a, it's a power multiplier, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, have you come across Reinhardt's work? Yeah, I think that you know he's really fascinating. You know, especially he his take on least as an theoretician of integration, right? Mm -hmm. Because we see him mainly as this, you know, protectionist, while in Germany he is regarded also as, you know, um, someone who advocated, you know, the lowering of barriers, of trade barriers between the German states. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, you know, least argues that uh, for the integration to be successful, uh, you you have to, you know, we have to have countries that are on a similar level level of you know uh, of the GDP per capita, but also they have to have um, a, a comparative advantage of their own, right? Uh, manufacturing activity with with uh, increasing returns, and uh, I read this great article by Reiner where he, you know, tries to, when he demonstrates that um, the integration in the European Union up to the 1980s was this symmetrical, successful kind of uh, integration. Mm -hmm. And by that he means, you know, the integration of the European South, uh, Spain and Portugal, and you know, to some extent, Greece, Mm -hmm. Though it's it's you know uh, manufacturing manufacturing capabilities were you know a little bit were slightly weaker than uh, than Spain's or Portugal's, so he he uh, you know he demonstrates that uh, this integration was um, was gradual, and the bar the you know tariffs were were being lowered gradually. Uh, over a period of 10 years, uh, the EU made, uh, you know, the EU, um, th th those countries received uh, substantial uh, funds for, for those, uh, for their, for the, you know, it, so, so uh, their industry has a chance to gear up to the technological level of, of the core countries of the EU. Um, so it was, they were like, you know, we could say that they were, you know, implementing the flying geese pattern mm -hmm. a bit, but the symmetrical integration, right, theorized by least, was interrupted by, uh, by the accession, by the integration of uh, East European countries. Mm -hmm. Right. The Eastern Europe interrupted the symmetrical integration of uh, the European South, and at the same time, the Eastern integration was was an asymmetrical one. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, this those problems the, those problems of the South were uh, aggravated still by you know this sort of uh, China shock. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the. Eastern countries, the Eastern European countries, they uh, became de facto, you know, um, you know, a Mexico of uh, Germany, right? Mm -hmm. So you, because of those differences in technological, uh, you know, um, possibilities and uh, discrepancies at the level of, of economies. And, uh, you know, you, you can, you could observe the split in, in, uh, in manufacturing and agricultural sector where you have this you know division between uh, on the one side the innovative high wage capital intensive ones and uh, segments and on the other hand uh, low wage not innovative uh, and not capital intensive ones uh, segments in the eastern europe right so um yeah, so I would say that uh, we, we were, you know, to talk about Poland a little bit, mm -hmm. 
So if I could make a remark, I would say that what, what Mexico is to the US, you know, Poland is that, to, Poland is the Germany is Mexico, I think, right? Yeah. Where we have some, you know, some high tech enclaves in, within our economy, but overall, it's uh, we you know we haven't got uh, those technological upgrades. We we couldn't catch up with the rest of the core countries, right? Um, and you know you could you see that in you know in many uh, you can measure that, for example, in by um, you know there, there's this basic measure of automation of a given economy. It's called robot density. It measures, you know, um, uh, how many robots that do, um, you know, how many robots are in the manufacturing uh, industries per ten thousand workers, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, the world average is, you know, I think one hundred thirty or something like that. You know, in Poland, it is as a, you know. If, I, I've seen the data for 2021, it's 63 robots or 10,000 workers, hmm. right? So it's way below the world average, not to mention that, you know, the leaders like South Korea, they have 900 robots. China has 250 and so on. So if you, you know, um, make the assumption that robotization is going to be one of the main engines of growth in the 21st century, you know, then you can see that we in, we are indeed the you know Mexico of of Europe. I see. Yeah, that's a that's a fascinating metric. Um, so if I I could be wrong in categorizing things this way, but if we were to say okay, there's uh, communist uh, Polish history, and then the break, and then there's sort of the immediate post communist period and reshuffling the deck. And then at some time in the 2000s, uh, you know, that kind of baggage is, is shed and, you know, Poland is, is part of Europe and is integrated. And as you say, is sort of fully in this supply chain of the Mexico to Germany. Um, so if those three periods exist, um, like, so how would you describe the Polish economy in each period? And were there things like obviously there's probably a lot of things that could have been done differently in the communist period but i think especially in the post-communist and then the period thereafter what was done right what was done wrong and if someone were to say you know you know P poland is industrial you know it is it, it does have factories it makes things you know why is why is that bad to be at that stage which it could still continue to grow so the three periods and then like uh the the remark that poland is still industrial although it might not be the most industrial uh yeah so you know uh in the communist period um you know despite um uh all the you know moral baggage right mm -hmm. uh, of repressions and so on mm -hmm. uh, of independent thought of you know yeah. and, you know for position and so on uh, a lot of things uh, they they managed to achieve you know some things in the domain of of you know manufacturing industries right mm -hmm. so they build up this base they also were building on uh, you know on this uh, on legacy of the you know pre-war period right right or in the on the legacy of interwar period right um, and uh, they managed to expand it and there comes you know you know uh, of course there were inefficiencies and you know problems of this sort and then comes the you know 1989 when you have the period of transition from com com communism to democracy, um, and uh, as I said, the you know there were there were many uh, you know firms companies that you know simply you know 
didn't have the ability to survive in market environment, right? Mm -hmm. But there were also many, many uh, firms that had the machinery, the equipment, right? That sometimes needed an upgrade and sometimes, you know, were, uh, you know, top notch that they, they can, you know, enter the, uh, they, they could compete with other uh, Western companies in, in certain, in certain sectors, in certain, in certain markets. But, you know, uh, the, the um, political, political uh, elite that uh, imposed its agenda in that period, you know, they were, uh, it was a moment of the, you know, heyday of neoliberalism, right? Mm -hmm. We had Jeffrey, Jeffrey Zachs here, right? Mm -hmm. So he was the main advisor and everybody wanted to show their zeal and basically they started to, you know, to sell everything. And um, they also sold some assets that could be, you know, useful in the later years. And I read this funny, you know, and one of those people that were, um, that were around back then uh, wrote to Milton Friedman. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, asking for advice, uh, asking what uh, Friedman thinks about those changes in Poland. And Friedman said that, you know, my God, you have to restrain yourself. That's this, you know, this uh, privatization is going too far, <laughs> right? So even Milton Friedman had some reservations about, you know, their, you know, um, the zeal with which they were privatiza privatizing, you know, everything in their sight, right? And on top of, the, of it all, um, you know, you had this this elite emerged that was a fusion of part of the de democratic opposition to the regime and the and of the you know uh, people from the regime itself, and they you know they um, hoarded. Or all the all the you know assets and the fact of money from selling those uh, from selling those you know plants factories and companies right so I would say that if you have this mental model right where you have you know on the one side you have East Asian development states on the other side you have predatory states like in Africa. And you know, in the middle, you have countries like Brazil or India in the 70s or 80s. I would say that probably Poland would be somewhere in the middle, right? With uh, this, you know, uh, disorganized bureaucracy, some, you know, uncoordinated efforts to modernize, and um, and with a lot of, you know, those clientelistic norms, clientelistic relations that were uh, squandering uh, that, you know, um, that squandered our potential in the end. I see, I see. So um, the private is, I mean, if you have Milton Friedman saying you're going to uh, too private, you're going to free market, that, <laughs> that might be a red flag. Um, so, so you really see that that middle period of the post-communist um, reshuffling as uh, an uncoordinated effort and and probably somewhat of an overreaction to um, align with the West and embrace um, neoliberal economics. Uh, now, did that change at some point? Was was there a kind of recognition of kind of maybe returning to more of a nationalist economic frame or has that, you know, total kind of uncoordinated alliance with the West perpetuated itself to today? Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, before, um, we are still, we are still in this, you know, um, we are part of German, supply chains 
Uh, and our advantage still lies in relatively cheap labor, right? And uh, there, there's, you know, I mentioned the flying geese pattern, right? When mm -hmm. in East Asia, mm -hmm. you know, you know, we can take example of a product, right? So yeah. you have, you know, for example, Japan is making hair dryers, but they upgrade the, their capacities and, you know, the hair drying uh, business is going to Taiwan and Japan is now making, you know, uh, flat TVs. Mm -hmm. Then Taiwan is also upgrading. So the production is shifting to Thailand. Taiwan is making TVs and Japan is making semiconductors, right? Mm -hmm. So they all ride this technological wave, right? And sequentially they improve. So we we in Poland we're stuck in this you know we're just stuck we're just trapped in this mm -hmm. low wage uh, uh, not you know economy where there's not a lot not a lot of innovation happening mm -hmm. and although you're right that that you know in the recent years there was this vaguely reformist drive. I think that it was mainly, you know, um, a change of, uh, you know, a change of slogans, mm -hmm. but we are at the same, at, still at the same place. And we, uh, we didn't, you know, realize that comparative advantage is something that, you know, can be constructed, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that we never asked ourselves a question, you know, can we deliberately change the position we fill in in the international division of labor? Right. And, you know, and I, I've seen no effort, you know, to identify those sectors that, you know, could potentially you know, spare what Albert Hirschman called uh, multidimensional uh, conspiracies in favor of uh, development, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and he says that it uh, it entails positive spin spillovers into the, into the rest of the economy, right? From this one productive sector. It can entail, you know, it, it, it molds, mm -hmm. Uh, developmental coalitions and I haven't seen you know any effort on that front and just you know contentment with status quo and you know uh, ideological skirmishes and bickering uh, and in view of mm. of uh, serious uh, consideration of our developmental possibilities yeah yeah um so that that makes a lot of sense and uh you know you've touched on some of the east asian examples there and you know there seems to be a, an entirely different mentality over there when we think about japan uh south korea taiwan singapore uh older hong kong to some degree and i think it's important to maybe separate those as a block and then you know China is very emulative of those, but China has its own thing going on. Um, but together, you know, they all have a, they, they, they don't have the same ideological baggage, it seems on, uh, you know, needing to embrace this like Uber uh, privatization um, or sort of like uh dispossessing their own national construct in order to achieve, um, you know, this global welfare metric, like, you know, if everyone's, if the big pie is getting bigger, of course, you know, everyone de facto must get richer and not just, you know, some asset managers. Um, so like, what is it about the East Asian economic perspective that you find intriguing? Um, Yeah, I think that what's uh, most intriguing to me is their model of state or of this, you know, state mm -hmm. economy interaction, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, 
Um, yeah, as I said, you know, I, 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 I have this mental model of the spectrum when you have the East Asian economies, developmental economies, intermediate ones, you know, those, those you know, uh, that fail a little and accomplish something and those predatory states. And you can, you know, and it's, you know, great to compare, uh, especially those extremes, and uh, by that I mean these predatory states and East Asian examples, uh, for example, when you take their uh, bureaucracies, right? So, um, the East Asian bureaucracies, they, um, they have this feature that Peter Evans called embedded autonomy. And by autonomy, he meant um, this ability to formulate uh, collective developmental goals. In predatory states, there's no autonomy in the sense that, uh, you know, um, every collect uh, that individual interests takes precedence over any uh, collective goal, right? So there's no autonomy, only the system of <coughs> extracting, uh, you know, resources from the citizenry, right? And um, what he, what, what Evans meant when he, um, when he was, uh, or what he meant by embeddedness was that um, the bureaucracy, this developmental bureaucracy is um, linked, has a set of connections to social groups that share the same joint project of transformation, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, first of all, you have this phenomenon and um, what's, what's also interesting and what's fascinating is the high quality of those bureaucracies, right? And in Japan, Korea, or, or China, you know, maybe it was easier for them as they were, um, you know, building on this accumulated institu institutional capital of, you know, this, this tradition of, of state exams, mm -hmm. right? And so on. But um, what they, uh, you can see you can see this high quality of these bureaucracies when you compare them uh, not only to those failed predatory states but to you know for example to to brazil or india where you know uh, india and brazil they tr they uh try to play the role the, their bureaucracies try to play the role of demiurge right mm -hmm. so they try to substitute the private uh sector the private producers and you know and build the companies uh, on their own, while the East Asian countries, the East Asian states, uh, they had this, you know, high capacity. They and because of that, they could restrict their intervention to more, you know, toward more strategic necessities. So their intervention was very selective, and that is perhaps. You know, also the reason for the uh, for the success, I think. So you have the selectivity, you have this meritocr highly meritocratic component, and um, uh, also this approach of not, you know, they didn't strive after being a demiurge in the economy, but more, uh, you know, they they wanted a role of a midwife, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. They didn't want to substitute, you know, private private uh, private sector, but to stimulate, to mold, to stimulate them to mold the environment, so as to induce them to venture into, you know, um, into areas where where there's a more uh, there are, there are um, transformative opportunities to be grasped, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, I think that's, that's interesting. And what's, what's, you know, what's also fascinating is, um, how those, uh, developmental states, Asian developmental states, how they, um, 
survived the, the Asian financial crisis. And there's this question whether the Asian financial crisis was um, caused by industrial policy, right? Mm -hmm. So when you when you take a closer look, I think that I don't know what's what's your opinion about this on this, mm -hmm. but when you take a closer look, I think that first of all you have to admit that it was this industrial policy that was responsible for the Asian miracle in the first place. Then you you for example you take the example of Taiwan and you know there was no crisis there, right? No crisis there. Then you look at Japan, and I think that you know every informed observer of Japan will admit that it was the crisis was not because of the the reason for the crisis was not the industrial policy, but you know ill time financial liberalization that uh, ill time financial liberalization and you know kind some kind of uh, macroeconomic uh, mismanagement and and not not the industrial policy and in the case of korea mm -hmm. um uh, the industrial policy this uh, is was already dism dismantled in the early 90s mm -hmm. before the debt started to build up um so i i think that um those models those examples are still very very valuable and subsequent events didn't you know didn't dep depreciate them right and still you you have this you know question of you know what's um how did they adapt mm -hmm. and you know i recently read some article in foreign affairs or foreign policy where where the author was you know uh, criticizing the Japanese state and Japanese economy as, you know, as being burdened by this legacy of industrial policy and state activism. But in another article, I seen this, you know, uh, data uh, about where, where you can build a semiconductor uh, factory the fastest. And, you know, it took the least amount of time in Japan, mm -hmm. right? Not in Taiwan, but in Japan. Mm -hmm. So you have, you know, I think that this legacy um, is still is still important. It's a good base to to you know to, it's a, you know, um, they they still have those instruments right to adapt and to react to changing to changing uh, to this fluid international environment that uh, suddenly we're we're in. And I think also, you know, to end this, <laughs> yeah. uh, that Japan is a, is a really, really country to, you know, because we have this um, image of Japan as very stagnant mm -hmm. and reactive, right? Mm -hmm. They have this demographical burden. Uh, it's an old society. So we see them as, you know, they're, they're lacking dynamism and basically that there's no hope for them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you like, I think that since the uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, the second government Shinzo Abe, uh, they managed to, you know, um, he, he, he managed to revive those uh, dynamic forces of Japan. And you can see it, you know, in this effort to broaden their economic scope in Asia mm -hmm. uh, through this um, quality infra infrastructure program that, that Abe, Abe uh, initiated. And it's, uh, I think that, you know, when you, when you take a closer look at the numbers, they are, you know, at the, at the rivalry with Belt and Road Initiative mm -hmm. in Asia. So I think that, um, Japan is a, is a country that, you know, always, you know, historically speaking, was full of surprises. And now maybe they're trying to surprise us once again, and we're just not paying attention. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was, um, that was a great uh, description of all of them. And 
I largely agree. I think um, there's been a distinction, uh, especially in um, uh, sort of the immediate post-war period of the 20th century and then going into uh, the turn of the century. And there's some issues that come up there. But I think on a relative basis, they've never quite shook this objective analysis of industrialization is good. It's good to make things. It's good to export things. It's good to have jobs for our citizenry and, you know, make sure they're employed. Um, uh, so I think that has always stuck with them. From what I've analyzed, um, you know, th there were certain uh, pinpricks to some of their models. And, and maybe that's because they became more integrated with the West uh, and the neoliberal sort of education system that comes along with that. Uh, you know, one of the fascinating examples that have I've kind of picked apart is um, looking at sort of Japanese banking, central banking in relation to its industrial strategy and how that changed over time. So in the immediate post-war period, uh, the Japanese miracle uh, was was largely caused, you know, by you know, efficient bureaucracy, private market dynamism, things like that. But a large component was the idea of window guidance from the Japanese central bank, where they would create credit quotas for the private banking system to say, you, know, you need to uh, expand credit in automobile manufacturing by X amount, or you know, you're you're going to be out of business essentially. Um, and so there were these hard and fast rules uh, for the Japanese private banking sector, which was not, you know, the Japanese at the federal level kind of commanding and saying, here's one outlet and we're going to just give it to our cronies and, um, you know, our special friends. It was a very distributed way of kind of going throughout all the banks and keenly the local banks uh, to say, look, everyone has a quota. You have to meet this. We don't care how you do it you know, you're in charge of figuring out who to give it to, how to divvy it up, all that stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, you have to meet this as a national objective. Uh, and so the the rise of Japan into the 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s, um, and why Japan became this pariah for the United States as it emerged into the 80s as this like competitor, the same way we think of China today. Um, is because of, of that um, disposition to using central banking to foster this industrial strategy and, and setting up quotas in, a, in an intelligent way to say, you know, we're directing credit into these productive capabilities. Um, from my reading of the situation, it appears that as you get into the late 70s and into the 80s, there is a transition of the old guard into a new generation of Japanese economists that. Um, Many were educated at think places like Harvard and, uh, you know, whether that was a specific type of um, uh, installation of certain beliefs or as the Japanese sort of reached their uh, capacity, you know, like there's only so much um, output you can get from increasing productivity in a certain way with certain technologies. And so they were perhaps reaching a ceiling that some people speculate at the same time that you had um, these westernized Japanese economists sort of getting into positions of high authority. Uh, and so when this starts to happen, um, notably, a lot of the central bank credit quotas start to shift uh, from things that were productive industrial capacity enhancing into things, most obviously real estate. And so this is where in the 80s, you know, people were saying like a block of Tokyo is worth all of, I think, California was the, the analogy. Um, and this was caused because through the central bank, there was this incentive structure to go to the, the distributed banks to then say, you know, kind of switch out of making cars and switch into more expanding money to fuel credit um, into real estate. Um, and so this eventually like, turn into a bubble, it popped. And then in the late 80s to the 90s, uh, the Japanese um, went about this whole system of, oh, well, of course, look, we have to change and liberalize and get rid of this um, baggage of industrial managerial bureaucracy that we're so used to. And I think while on a relative level, you know, the Japanese are still sort of a great case study and example uh, going into today, 
But I think there was this attempt uh, to kind of marginalize the Japanese growth or, and then the Japanese maybe had to figure out like how they would still maintain the sort of national objectives, but through this keyhole now of uh, Western neoliberalism and, and trying to concede certain things and, and hold on to certain others. So I, I think that what has to do with a lot of potential problems that you do see in these East Asian economies, um, where I think like the notable things are, you know, if we had to think of criticisms, you know, it's the sort of workaholic culture, it's uh, the low fertility rate. Um, yeah. There's a certain like inequality to young people um, that has, you know, just do not have sort of a lot of ability to get a leg up. and. Um, and a certain like there is a sense of maybe stagnant uh, sort of growth to some degree, um, especially now. So but I would say, like, again, like, are these problems because of the industrial strategy that was fostered in the in the earlier period when these all these countries experienced amazing growth and amazing growth from, you know, especially in Korea's case? I mean, the Korean case is unbelievable the level they started at in the 60s and where they got to by the 80s um, and experiencing massive inflation, which we're told is like the worst thing in the world all along the way to get there. And I would I would think many of the Koreans would say, um, you know, yeah, that's a good trade. We'll take the inflation if everyone is now, you know, not a farmer and, uh, you know, has modern uh, amenities. So I, I think the older industrial policies were the right move by them. And I think uh, as much as there's intrinsic criticisms to everything, including them, uh, the fact that there was a neoliberalization that occurred sort of in the 90s into the 2000s with the East Asian development economies, that has created a lot of the problems that get attributed to the older industrial models. Yeah, I want to ask you a question. You know, I heard um this uh conspiracy theory you know okay that it's a it's a fun one yeah, yeah that, we're all we're, uh, we're all friends here. <laughs> that uh the Jap the you know that ja the J japan popped the bubble in a controlled way because they never wanted to be that they you know they do not want it to be seen as this rival of the US. Uh -huh. They had enough of it and they wanted, you know, uh, you know, do a controlled demolition mm -hmm. and you know settle with being uh, number two. Interesting. What's your take on it? Yeah, because um I, I think by necessity, I think my conclusion has to be like just on my reading of it, um just this sort of coincidences <laughs> it's you know even though that sounds like i'm uh, being lame uh the coincidences <laughs> of history of uh the americanization of japanese economists by going to harvard and learning neoliberal economics um and reaching certain pro productivity ceilings i think the combination of that just incentivized this like thinking of we got to change uh, and that started with the 80s and fueling the property bubble. And then when the property bubble burst, you know, there was this great argument to say we need to change. Um, so so I think those coincidences make sense to me by themselves. I think then if I had to place a conspiracy on it, I, I would say probably, you know, the American uh, apparatus that it is uh probably you know took deliberate actions to to somewhat increase the chances of those certain japanese economists getting into place certain policies getting pushed through by them and you know this this turn from industrial growth to asset growth and then bubble um that that just seems like it makes sense from what the americans were doing at the time how they were criticizing japan that uh they would get up to uh uh, certain activities that would create that situation. Uh, I have not heard this conspiracy, though, that you've talked about, where the Japanese themselves, thinking like in 3D chess, saw the the potentialities of like, what does it mean to be 
arrival to America? Do we want to, we want to be in that position? And, you know, they kind of took this uh, controlled demolition strategy where they could just like safely stay kind of in this like top number two spot. Yeah. Um, I mean, it kind of makes sense to me. The Japanese are, I think, pretty aware of themselves and their history and, and sort of America's place in that and how the, you know, the, their, their best positioning is by having America as an ally. Um, so I guess that makes sense to me. I do you like what, what would be the, um, I guess like, you know, were there Japanese politicians or bureaucrats that, uh, I, I guess they wouldn't admit it, but, you know, is is there quotes or things like that that you've seen that kind of lead you to that conclusion? No, no, it's just you know some yeah. French theory. Ah, okay. But, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, but but it's interesting, and that and that's the thing where um, I think it gets back to like kind of the general point of protectionist economics, national economics, is even though maybe that wasn't like the best for their industrial strategy um implicit in in the strat in the conspiracy that you mentioned with the japanese is they have to think of themselves as a nation among competing nations and they have to think of these international uh political dimensions that aren't just are we increasing global welfare um you know what's the poverty rate doing um you know what what is the average individual um you know, wealth, uh, you know, blah, blah, stuff like that. Um, they are thinking in a humanities-based way um, where they have to understand uh, power dynamics. They have to understand, um, you know, again, like the his the history of what does it mean to challenge it, the American sort of hegemony. Um, yeah. Have you read this book by, uh, mm -hmm. I think his name is Landis, and the book is called... Uh, Unbound Prometheus on on rivalry between you know uh, Great Britain and Germany in the uh, in the nineteenth nineteenth uh, century at the beginning of the twentieth. So Landis says that uh, the German advantage was was you know not only in institutions uh, but and attitudes also, and attitudes as well. And he says something along, along the lines that um, the Brit British entrepreneur could be rational, but still his calculations were distorted mm -hmm. by the shortness of his horizon. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is the, you know, the advantage that East Asians and Japan you know, have over over the Western uh, approach to economics, right? And this, you know, the popping of the bubble. <laughs> yeah. Maybe this one of those, you know, genius moves. Yeah. Well, I I I feel like I've come across Landis or you know his his take there. Um, you haven't directly read him, I think. Uh, but that makes sense to me. I mean, the, the way I look at the turn of the 20th century is. Um, you know, you had the beginning of the 19th century where, you know, England's on top, it has the global empire, it is the first major power of the Industrial Revolution. And then by the end of the 19th century, um, the number two, number three, European, and of course, America, uh, those nations industrialize themselves and start rising up. And then, you know, have the, you have the scramble to expand into you know, French colonies, German colonies, which they were the laggards. But I think that uh, ultimately, while World War One is full of contingencies of um, uh, rational and irrational um, things outside of economics, um, I, I do think there was almost this macro necessity of, okay, you have all of these, you know, rising economic powers, eating away the oxygen and there is going to be a conflict you know Br britain is not going to accept germany being equal or better to it or the you know all that stuff so so i think in the in the 
hindsight of history, like going back to what you said about Japan, like are, is Japan looking at that and understanding, um, you know, if, if we are perceived to be challenging enough to the competing bloc, then, uh, you know, then, then we're going to be in some sort of cold or hot conflict. Um, and like, do we think we can win that? I, or do, do we even want to bother uh, putting ourselves in those situations? And, and maybe the Japanese are ultimately, you know, vindicate, like if that's what they did, <laughs> the Japanese are ultimately vindicated. Cause if we look at China, uh, and China has differences, of course, you know, it being a larger population and uh, the Middle Kingdom and all these st- things that come along with that. Um, the Chinese, even though they haven't directly, like, really gotten into conflict with the United States, the Japanese, I think, especially now in the post-Trump and especially post-Biden era, um they are they are treated with so much hostility. I don't think the Japanese were ever really um, were given the same sort of sticks uh, that America has done. I mean, Biden had. I mean, Trump participated in the trade war with them. Uh, Biden has recently uh, said, if you're working over in China, like on semiconductors or stuff like that, you better get the hell out of there, um, and is imposing some harsh things on China. Uh, you know, and trying to pr- prohibit the Europeans from uh, trading the intellectual property on semiconductors over there. So um, the lithography machines. So here we see that China is actually getting compromised just by the sheer fact that they are this, this comp- seen as a competitive power to the United States bloc. Yeah, and I, you know, I... I was thinking still about this, the Western, this, um, you know, this inability of the West to think, you know, in the, in the um, long term to consider, you know, uh, all those, um, this broad horizons, horizon of events. And uh, I, I thought about, you know, two things. One is this quote from Deng Xiaoping mm-hmm. when he said that, you know, the Arabs, they have oil and we will have rare earths, right? Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about, you know, how Japan has secured so many, you know, uh, rare earth resources as, you know, in 2010, they had this very um, intense um they had this conflict with, with the Chinese over Senkakus, the Senkaku Islands. I think that the Japanese, they detained some, you know, some uh, ca- Chinese captain. They, they you know, uh, they, catch, uh, they catch the boat or something like that, you know. And in response, the Chinese, they, uh, they curbed the exports of rare earths to Japan. And what's particular particular about rare earths and the Japanese economy is that twenty five percent of the uh, value of Japanese exports are tied to rare earths mm. in some some way, right? Electronics and you know other stuff. Yeah. So by cutting them from rare, earth, rare earths, they would basically cripple the Japanese economy. And in 2010, the Japan was, you know, dependent on China. In I think that I think that they bought they imported like 90 percent of rare earth metals from from uh, from from China. And after the incident, this altercation over Senkaku's, mm-hmm. they decided that you know, uh, it's you know, it's pro- probably it, it, this now is the time to think about reducing this overdependency and now they achieve they you know lowered this dependency rate to like uh, 57 it's hovering around 60 right mm-hmm. 60% and you know they they were at it you know for 10 years and now when you look at the all, all the rare earth resources mines and so on uh, they already you know um, 
the the world is um, divided between you know what is Japanese and what belongs to China, with some fraction that is that belongs to the U.S. And coming back to the shortness of horizons and the problem of attitude toward you know future and long term thinking, you can see how uh, how uh, how uh, you know inane. Mm -hmm. uh, all, uh, all, all those you know declarations on the part of the EU that you know from now on we will reduce our dependency in the you know in the domain of our earths to for you know uh, we will reduce all, to, to you know I don't know to some levels but this is all unattainable and it only can be done I don't know probably through through charity on the part of the US and Japan right and this is all you know a big failure of imagination. And I think that, you know, as I said before, that probably probably the, the Asians still have this, you know, advantage in, in using the imagination a lot more than 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 us. Yeah, I mean, my, my, I have a pet theory that, um, you know, why were the East Asian economies that were inside the Western Alliance like Japan and South Korea, you know, why were they somewhat immune to the same ideological viruses that has infected Europe uh, sort of in similar positions. Uh, my pet theory is I just think the Americans were lazy and uh, they had an easier time going back and forth with their European, you know, counterparts yeah. language wise. And they just, uh, the, the East Asians just had the benefit of being a difficult language and culture for the Americans uh, to penetrate and infuse certain ideological um, uh, baggage, baggage into their cultures. Uh, but that's, that's just something that I, that I, uh, ponder. But, uh, do you think that then if Japan is taking all these sort of like long-term wise steps that, uh, aren't always obvious in the immediate, does that mean like, is China as, you know, it's, it's place in the global economy kind of correlated to its population size. So like proportionally makes sense, but is China acting in an opposite fashion where uh, it's kind of going headfirst into confrontation and uh, it, it's, it's not sort of delicately trying to uh, uh, do the thing that the Japanese did, which is sort of stay in, I guess a subordinate position to the American hegemony uh, while still being very powerful. Um, so like, is, is China like not acting as smart and wise as Japan in the long term? Uh, as one question, then the second question is like, does China have a choice? Like, is it just so big? And are, are these sort of forces of history uh, just necess like it has to confront the American hegemony because it's a huge population because where it situates itself in the East Asian landmass, how that extends out into Eurasia, you know, Belt and Road and all that. Like, is this just inevitable that it has to confront America? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And I've I just, you know, I'm thinking on the spot. Sure. And um, I think that maybe, you know, a refreshing way uh, to to maybe we should like, you know, see China just just like you know japan as an example of developmental state that reached some point of maturity and has to confront with with certain problems uh, like you know surplus savings and surplus capacities and the belt and road initiative and also this you know uh, the program for quality infrastructure that is you know um you know, Japanese built and road, they are, you know, uh, that's their method to deal with, with those problems, right? They try to broaden the, their economic scope and, and, and you know, to, to find sites, sites for, for investment, um, especially given that, you know, uh, there are going to be a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for infrastructure investments in East Asia, so I think that the only I think that the two differences between 
Japan and China on that count would be that China started catching up, catching up a lot, uh, you know, later than Japan, which you know uh, started after the Second World War. China started, you know, after the Deng Xiaoping, uh, you know, opening reforms, market uh, liberalization reforms, mm-hmm. um, and you know they weren't as as connected to the Cold War alliance mm-hmm. as the Japanese were, right? They, you know, they they pivoted towards the U.S., towards the West a little bit uh, after the, you know, the, after the Nixon uh, Nixon Kissinger visit, right? So I think that maybe it's you know it's the problem of being outside of the Western alliance and also the problem of the timing, right? But in the end, we can see that they reach the same maturity level and you know we should you know maybe take into account that they are more autistic towards west than japan because they hadn't you know uh, a lot of a lot of opportunities to you know um um yeah to be penetrated by western culture you know and they had they haven't got a lot of opportunities to establish this kind of connections that Japanese had, right? So yeah. that's why they're acting all you know aggressive and yeah. And if and if you think of uh, the experience of the confrontation with the West originally between the two nations, um, obviously China unfortunately had the the worst outcome of just getting colonized and getting dominated, getting hit with the opium and everything in the 19th century that, um, you know, delayed their development and their national, you know, imperatives. Whereas Japan encountered um, the gunboats of America in the middle of the 19th century, um, somewhat after China, had to kind of take a bit of... uh, you know, had had to open their ports, had to sort of shine unfair trade treaties uh, with the West, but remarkably, you know, were able to contain that and immediately started to ask the question, how do we get out from this? Like, we understand what the West has done to other uh, non-European places. Uh, we can look across at China, especially, we can see what's happening there. Um, you know, we all need to collectively like sober up and and modernize. And so that's where, of course, you get the Meiji period and, you know, a phenomenal period of history of this this, uh, sort of intense contradiction of nationalism infused with like um, a hyper cosmopolitanism of sending sort of young Japanese out to Germany, England, the United States to educate themselves on especially the technology, but also the political systems, all everything that they thought, you know, what, what made the West able to do this to us? They come back and they reform their government um, and they, they start figuring out how to create an economy that can compete. And uh, by 1911, they defeat Russia in the war against them. And, you know, this is sort of, I think, the inflection point of, you know, fully seeing from the 18... 18- 60s when the gunboats first came from America to the Japanese harbor to 1911, uh, where they defeat a European power that shocked the world. Um, you know, the Japanese just had this amazing ability to sober up, to reflect, and to modernize very rapidly. And so, like that's that's the Japanese experience starting all the way back in the 1860s. Whereas China's, uh, you know, perhaps again, to the contingencies of history, um, you know, they were able to get uh, more dominated. Uh, they were able to be put in more of a backward state for longer. Um, on You know, on top of that, not only were uh, the Western powers dominating the Chinese, uh, internally, the Chinese uh, felt that they were being dominated by the Qing, who were these foreign Manchus uh, oppressing the native Han nationality. Uh, and so by the time we have sort of a dithering of Western powers and the rise of sort of uh, Sun Yat-sen Chinese nationalism in the turn of the 20th century, 
the gripe Sun Yat-sen was really talking about was against the Qing uh, that was fueling a lot of animosities because the Qing were seen as these sort of uh, derelict rulers that allowed the West to do this to China. And so like these formative periods for the Chinese, this like kind of didn't happen in the same way it did for the Japanese. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the 1910s occur, Sun Yat-sen gets his revolution. There's a momentary um, satisfaction and sort of creation of this new Chinese state. Um, unfortunately, then this breaks out into a warring period, uh, local generals and warlords start to emerge to claim their territory. And this is like a huge, this is like a huge problem for then that vision of Sun Yat-sen of development. Um, and then of course the Japanese then through their uh, forces of history uh, then take over and, you know, have their war front in China uh, for a long period of time. And this, and, and again, it's sort of like this arrested development China sits in uh, sort of in the 19th century, has a momentary break, and then is back in arrested development, if not degrada degradation. And by the time the Japanese are out and Mao comes to power, uh, you know, they're recovering from this war, and then they have to kind of go through this, um, you know, uh, terrible communist sort of uh, cultural revolution. And again, they're sort of in this arrested development. Uh, and I think everyone would probably agree that it's with Deng Xiaoping that you have sort of returned to like a growth mindset and thinking sort of in this objective, I'll call it the Meiji perspective of like, how do we start emulating? How do we start doing things uh, to grow our economy? You know, how do we read books like Frederick List? Um, and so really with Deng Xiaoping, and as you get into the 80s, the 1980s were the first time that the Chinese really kind of uh, uh, were, were able to like kind of mature in this way. And so going back to your original point, to tie this all together, um, the Japanese started this maturation prop process in the 1860s. The Chinese started in the 1980s. And it goes to show that the sort of wisdom that comes with having to deal with the West um, is perhaps just sort of lost on the Chinese to some degree because they're kind of teenagers at the table. Whereas, you know, the Japanese were at the League of Nations, you know, sitting at the table with the other European powers. So they are much more dexterous with understanding how they have to negotiate their place in sort of the international order. Yeah. So just, um, that yeah. was a lot, but go go for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. At the same time, they are you know those teenagers, mm -hmm. but they are. Um, there's this, you know, on the one hand, you, you know, you know, the talk about the China dream that China is the last country where, you know, people are looking uh, towards the future and so on. And in contrast with America or Europe and so on. But um, on the other hand, they are extremely conscious they're about history they're extremely focused focused on history mm -hmm. it's it's really i think um it's really uh, extraordinary because you know i i read you know about their how they educated their you know part the party how they educated the party elites with this like three or four hour movie about the fall of Soviet Union, right? And, you know, those hundreds of thousands of people had to watch this, you know, um, boring documentary because the, the party wanted to ingrain in them that, you know, these were the errors that we can't afford to make. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also, uh, you know, we were talking about Japan and the Japanese bubble, and I also read that you know after the the bubble after bubble popped, uh, the Chinese sent you know 
the, the, the you know economists from the party so they could study there in Japan you know the causes of the bubble and you know the whole macroeconomic environment and another thing is that I think that they created some institute some you know uh, some body some think tank you would say that uh, was that was you know um, concentrated on all those histories of growth in the West, and they were like you know collecting all the ideas about what caused this this sudden burst of growth in the West and what give what what gave uh, the West this great advantage and so on. So it's a very interesting you know mix where they blend this confidence. This, this, you know, this hope, this confidence in the future, and still they are very, very, you know, um, absorbed by, by the meditation upon the past. Yeah, yeah, and that's um... and that gets us back, you know, to the uh, Eric Heliner's book, right? That yeah. thanks to him, <laughs> we can, you know. Uh, imitate them a little bit and re and you know uh consider all those economic ideas that you know in the end aren't so old and that shaped the destiny of the west for the past you know uh, 200 years right yeah and um i think what highliner points out too what i was kind of thinking on uh was that a kind of return of history of them, you know, not just looking at the West and other modern examples, but like going back into their own internal histories and finding thinkers from earlier ages that kind of talked about this developmental sort of stuff. Um, you know, Highlander talks about how the Japanese did that. And there's, there's people throughout Japanese history that speak to that. The Chinese did the same thing. And, you know, it, it, and in, in one sense, uh, it complicates the sort of diffusionist argument of historians that, you know, there were all of these uh, intellectual innovations that occurred in the West, and then it diffused to uh, the rest of the world, and the rest of the world kind of picked up on that. And even though, like, nationalist economics is sort of inherently more multipolar and, um, uh you know, not not so centering of Europe, um, it, a lot of it still kind of holds on to that diffus diffusionist argument, um, which in one sense is true, like List and Kerry ended up in Japan, their works. Um, but in another sense, it's sort of like, obviously, it can't be true, because these are uh, civilizations onto themselves. Of course, they have thinkers that were talking about these things. And it's really just because we don't speak their language. We don't read enough of their literature that like, we don't have the comprehension to like understand their own canons that feed into how they shape their ideology. So, um, so yeah, so that's where like China's is like looking back and, you know, people talk about like kind of the Confucian uh, return that China's trying to do. Like it's more Confucian than it is Marxist per se that some people speculate on. Um, and so going along with that is like this return to understanding, like, what were the economic ideas that fueled sort of certain histories of China? And then as the West encroaches into China, like, what were the economic dimensions of that? Why did the West become more powerful? Why was China backwards? And this is where Sun Yat-sen, as Highliner points out, um, like really hammered on the economic point that like the reason China got dominated in the 19th century is because their economy was more backwards and less developed. And before you do anything else, you have to get your economy right because then you can actually have the military might to push back those encroachers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I think what's interesting is you made a great quote by uh, Pierre Dayan uh, where... Um, you cited his quote where he says, with its own Bible, its church and prophets. Um, so Dion argues that mer mercantilism never crystallized into a rigid doctrine with its own Bible, its church and its prophets. Um, so I think as sort of a conclusionary statement, what do you think of that quote? 
why, as we've talked about, protectionism and nationalist economics, neo mercantilism is actually so expansive and so utilized throughout history by many different nations. But why does it have this perennial problem of being vague, being hidden, not having the same types of avatars of like, when we think of economics, I think Adam Smith, capitalism, I think Karl Marx, Marxism, these are avatars that within them contain these tenants that we can then keep extrapolating. But we really don't find that as much as we'd like to give that to maybe a Frederick List or an Alexander Hamilton. Like we we don't have, as Dayon said, this this Bible, this church, and these prophets. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I don't want to answer with another quote, yeah. <laughs> but Emmanuel Todd, also a French writer, French thinker, you know, in his introduction to French translation of uh, the national system of political economy, mm -hmm. He said that one of the main differences between you know protectionists and uh, free traders, liberals, is that uh, uh, the latter they want to design or they in, they want to design some kind of economic paradise, right? Mm -hmm. And the former are you know just pragmatic. They and, you know, it's, I think that this ideology, if we can say this about new mercantilism, it's, you know, it's, it's an, sometimes it's difficult for these ideas to, to win all those uh, ideological skirmishes as it doesn't, um, you know, up, doesn't, it doesn't use all those emotional abstractions, right? Like humanity, eternal peace, and you know, so on. So I think that's that's maybe its weakness. But on the other hand, I think that this pragmatism uh, is so strong that even Adam Smith, you know, uh, late. Um, this maxim that defense is more important than opulence, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that in uh, periods of, you know, of, uh, let's say, geo geoeconomical disturbance, as, you know, uh, and we are, I think we are living through in, uh, a period like this, I think that the period we are living in now is the period of this geo geoeconomic fragmentation and disturbance. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, in times like this, this pragmatist will come back and you know revive and bring back some of those insights that hopefully will help us you know uh, pass through this this troubling and you know demanding times. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I know the quote from Smith and uh, from my reading, uh, I would argue, and I think other, I think Highliner maybe mentions it too, like Smith is probably actually more in line with uh, neo-mercantilist yeah. thoughts um, than people sort of properly believe him as this sort of libertarian icon. Um, uh, yeah, like S Smith in a lot of ways was responding to mercantilists of the earlier age, criticizing them. And the neo-mercantilists were sort of kind of absorbing those criticisms to sort of refine mercantilism to an extent. Um, like the idea that like everything was about just accumulating gold, uh, I think was probably like the big uh, change that occurred between uh, you know, the 18th and the 19th century, like it, it shifted from just accumulate all the gold you can to productive power uh, as the objective that you optimize for, um, rather maximize. Uh, and then it was really like kind of this afterglow of English uh, liberals that kind of took on Smith as this, I guess, like kind of cherry picked, uh, concerns that they had from Smith 
and kind of rose him up. And like Ricardo is is more so the father of, I would say, like liberalism, economic liberalism in the English English tradition uh, than probably Smith is and creating more of that distinct barrier between uh, mercantilism, the Smith criticism, neo-mercantilism, and then this tradition of uh, liberalism that I would argue also like, you know, gave birth to to Marxism. I mean, like Marx was like very complimentary of Ricardo and and Reinhardt talks all the time about how like Marx and liberalism are sort of these like twins that come out of the 19th century. And um, the real oppositional force to them is uh, this view of neo-mercantilism or nationalist economics. Um, so yeah, so that's that's quite interesting. So with that being said, I think there's one last question that maybe quickly, if you're if you're able to answer, uh, given your European perspective, and I'm always curious to this myself, think and yeah. especially like in the context of List, how he thought about um, who who was a nation that had the ability to do the things that he talked about, um, and how this contrasted also his contemporary Henry Carey, who like didn't have certain criteria. Um, whereas like List would say only certain nations could do it. Kerry would be more of saying like any nation could do it. Um, so with that being said, with European uh, perspective that you have and understanding the relationship like that Poland has, as you described them in Mexico to Germany, uh, do you think that in order to compete in the multipolar uh, order that has now uh, dawned on us, does Europe need to actually be a civilizational state uh, where it has to aggregate itself in this gigantic block of 700 million people in order to compete with the 1 billion people of China and like, you know, vassals of China. Um, you know, is that the really only way to compete in the multipolar world? Um, because if it's just like, okay, France is doing its own thing, Germany, Poland's doing its own thing, um, resource constraints, all of that, do, is there really a chance that Europe can can have its own sovereignty and its own um, developmental competition, or is it beholden uh, to be sort of a backwater of the future because it's not a civilizational state like uh, China or even you know you could say America? Oh. <laughs> Maybe that's, that's not a quick a answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. And you know, um, you know, first of all, when you think about the relations between the uh, EU and uh, China, I think that um, you know you see this fragmentation in attitudes. You have two camps, the you know, restrictionist camp that that you know wants to follow in the footsteps of the US and uh, gradually decouple, right? Mm -hmm. And you have the, you know, camp that is still trying to uh, maintain the cooperation of China, right? And when you try to, um, you know, calculate uh, or, you know, when you try to assess uh, which camp is more powerful? I would say that you know the camp of cooperation is still you know still has the upper hand because uh, you know all those the most powerful European companies and by that I mean Ger I mean German companies are really invested in relationship with China. So they're, you know, uh, they are double, doubling down on their investments there. They, uh, they really, uh, really close um, with Beijing and uh, Germany. So, you know, this is like the chain of command that you have uh, Germany and its foreign policy that is being dicta dictated by industrial lobbies and the foreign policy of the EU you know, in the end, depends on, on, on Berlin. So I think that's, that's the main, uh, you know, that's a big hurdle. Um, you know, certainly another big hurdle is, you know, 
is that a uh, big, big obstacle is that the European Union never uh, never created a, a consistent industrial policy. And, you know, I think that, uh, I don't know if you read this article on Phenomenal World about Eurochip. Mm -hmm. I haven't. I don't know if you read it. No. Um, so, you know, in the 80s, you know, um, America was scared of the Japan. So they, you know, about the, you know, progress in semiconductors. So they uh, uh, um, struck a deal with them that they have to limit their market share in the US. So the Japanese, you know, given that, uh, dumped, you know, those semiconductors in the European market and that, um, uh, alerted the Europeans, they realized that they are, you know, they have this, uh, that they are really, you know, um, losing ground in this domain. And they, um, they try to establish some sort of industrial policy on the, you know, European, uh, European, European level. But in the end, uh the biggest firms the incumbents they captured or captured all the funds and you know there was not a lot of uh, innovation but you know i think that there's you know still hope if they if they could try to imitate the you know the example of the us there's this really you know fascinating article the author uh, author's name is fred block and it's called swimming against the current. And his main thesis is that uh, there is a developmental state in the US, and, and but it's decentralized. He calls it uh, developmental network state, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, you know, concentrated in a single, you know, bureaucratic body institution, but it's, you know, dispersed in many agencies, you know, and and he was, was interesting, right, and counterintuitive. He points to the Reagan era as the moment when this the, when this developmental network network state arises, because then you have this, um, uh, you know, all these initiatives, as for example, Sematech, uh, where they they when where ARPA gives money to form uh, some sort of consortium with the top uh, top US semiconductor companies and you know ARPA gives money the, the, those uh, companies uh, contribute also themselves and they uh, you know they try to uh, catch up with Japan and in the end you know this initiative ended with a, you know um, moderate uh, success as they regained some market share from foreign companies. The another project was the human human g genome project, right? Mm -hmm. And there are also you know some other examples of this state activism that is um, you know not in the limelight, maybe, but uh, you know is 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 still there. And I think that uh, European Union you know, should um, try to imitate this decentralized structure by utilizing, you know, the best, uh, the best practices in, you know, best available practices in, in, in European countries, right? So I think that that's maybe the way, but, you know, uh, to tell you the truth, I'm not sure if they can, you know, <laughs> foster that into existence. Yeah, well, that's, that's certainly interesting. Like, and I think this is probably like where critics of neoliberalism kind of maybe take a, like an L of, you know, they're so critical and there's like obvious data we can talk about in the U S of, uh, manufacturing, um, labor employment that's declined, you know, wealth inequality has r risen, you know, things like this, we can, we can kind of go down and say, look, this is what you do when you financialize your economy. That's bad. Uh, but I think it's also wrong to say like the U S is nothing but a financial market at this point. Like it's, it's still the most powerful country in the world by a lot of metrics. It has this 
um, you know, very, very large uh, uh, military industrial complex, obviously. And that, like you talked about DARPA, like these tentacles like feed down into the private sector and like are able to create a lot of the tech innovations we have, the internet, the, uh, you know, we go to Google and find all these connections. Um, and so like interesting that in some sense, you know, there's, there's no co coherence, there's no uh, actual coordinated conscious industrial policy anymore, but through maybe inertia and these like institutional bureaucracies that just have legacies, uh, they've been able to create, as you say, this network state within the United States that still proliferates um, a quasi-industrial strategy. Whereas perhaps Europe, just, like obviously they haven't been a unified structure that long. Uh, they don't have uh, that network in place to affect all the countries. Um, but I would, but I would say that's that's more the feature, not the bug of the European Union and like a, a unified general Europe. Um, and and so that's my criticism. Like I I understand. This is why I'm curious to know your opinion, because um, I understand the argument that Europe needs to unify as a bloc to to matter in a multipolar world. Uh, but I but I also think that's um, that's a losing battle because Europe is a continent of nations. Um, yeah, like that. Like that's a real thing and. Is it any real curiosity that that network state that you talked about has not come into existence and that there has been asymmetric development in much of Europe and the European Union has, and the currency union especially, has fostered asymmetric development? Um, I, I think that is more just a, a feature of the fact of if you try to group these macro level categories of nations together, you are going to get a situation where even in the, in the best intentions that the Germans of course have, they're all angels over there. Um, they're going to necessarily instinctually uh, understand themselves as prioritizing the German economy over everybody else. And that's Europe. I mean, Europe is the German economy one with all its problems. Uh, it's, uh, screwed over Greece, screwed over a bunch of people. It's it's sought to like privatize those markets. Um, uh, you know, the French have their own system to some degree and they're still very powerful. But, um, you know, the, the, the European Union, the Eurozone is a system designed to prop up Germany at the expense of the other countries to be consumer markets and, in, and indebted to Germany. Like that's that's the function of it. So, um, I think due to just like the constraints of reality, like China got lucky. It's a, it's, it's this huge plane where you have one nation inside of it that can grow very large. Europe, on the other hand, is a lot of geographically separated nations, uh, you know, that you have like 10 million here, 10 million there, 60 million, maybe a hundred million over there, um, that have this diversity that prevents it from actually having a unified state. So I guess fine. So what, what do you think about that constraint, which seems to correlate with uh, what Frederick Liss kind of talked about? Um, yeah, I, I think that um, I'm partial to this interpretation you know, of yeah. Europe. Mm, and uh, honestly, I, I think that you know I I've been radicalized, you know, over the past few years, <laughs> and I'm more you know of the view of Dominic Cummings, you know, okay. that Europe is. Um, you know, I remember in a few years ago there was discussion, you know, in Europe because EU had this some sort of crisis of identity, right, mm -hmm. and you know. They ask themselves the question, what role we should take in the world order, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and um, I think that the the answer that emerged back then was that the EU should become what they called a regulatory empire, 
right? <sighs> that they should create regulations and standards and, you know, uh, hope that the whole world will, you know, accept them as their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, that exactly, um, that you can, you know, that they hear, um, you can see, you know, this lack of ambition. And uh, I think that the inertia of this bureaucracy is, is going to be very, very hard to overcome. And, uh, you know, given that, I think that the world will, be, uh, will become, you know, um, much more turbulent, much more uh, disturbing for this for for European institutions. I think that the best way right now is you know um, is to concentrate you know on 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 those on examples of those countries that thrive in you know period of turbulences as Singapore or Israel and try you know to forge your own way. And you can't for, forge this, you know, you can uh, you, you can't explore your own path if you don't have the you know necessary instruments for it. And all of those instruments have been you know taken from us from the nation states by Brussels. Yeah. So we have to, you know, knock on the door, take what's what's ours and get out of the European Union. So that's my, you know. That will be my conclusion, of course. You know, in Poland, it's <laughs> mm -hmm. it's like extremely, extremely French opinion, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, and it, it seems that as as much as the propaganda would want to make Europe out to be like so unified, um, you know, there's there's all these different instances of um, contrasting elements i mean for one it's like the german approach to energy and we all see how the germans are doing with that you know they got rid of um like you know a lot of their uh nuclear you know they try to do wind and solar super smart you know landlocked uh rainy cloudy uh <laughs> part of the world and you know just the other day they were burning um like some of the most coal and like had the biggest co2 footprint in all of europe uh because the sun wasn't shining the wind wasn't blowing uh whereas france who was sending them nuclear power like since de gaulle prioritized nuclear had a little hiccup with that i've seen you you've written about nuclear to some degree um but like okay like the french have this uh vestigial attachment to nuclear the norwegians have an obvious attachment to um uh you know fossil fuels it's a huge part of their economy um you know th there's all these different instances of uh ways in which the european continent actually really can't come together because there are these are these enshrined differences that you can't just like have a uniform policy over and i think if you try to actually attempt to do like carve outs uh and exemptions for certain nations I mean, you're just going to end up creating animosities that end up then, you know, why isn't everyone in their own like sovereign nation state deciding these things? Like, why do they need to go to Brussels to do that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, in the multipolar order, like it seems like if we're being consistent, like the European Union came in place because of a unipolar order or like, you know, bipolar and then flourished in the unipolar. Um, so if we're now going multipolar, like, the institution that was created in the American hegemonic unipolar order, the EU, like that probably goes away because there are too many differences. France wants to ally with more with China, you know, maybe um, the UK wants to ally more with America, um, depending on who's in power over there. Um, so, I mean, Ireland certainly wants to ally with America, which I have as Ireland sort of my more case study. Um, of choice, uh, and I find that problematic. But um, yeah, so I, I, I just, it seems like we are gonna approach that inevitability, whether anyone wants it or not, that the EU will break up. Um, I think the Eurozone should first break up, um, more importantly. 
Uh, and then it's just sort of the challenge of history for the Europeans to figure out how do we compete as these nations of 10 million to maybe 100 million people here and there with these these sort of larger uh, nation states. Um, and, that, and that's the question for national economists uh, or people that study that, like, I guess, ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, great. Well, thank you for your time. I, I think this was fascinating. Um, I recommend everybody go read your articles. Um, I found them really good, uh, especially, you know, your commentaries on European politics and economy. And, um, uh, you know, you talked about the French quite a bit, the nuclear issues. Um, so, yeah, if you could plug links or anything you're working on, you want people to check out, please do. Okay, great. Thanks. It was a pleasure.